knowledge and use of the problem we are dealing with here, which is this uh, the NK threat in our day. Uh, I know that it's uh, this is not. I mean, I'm I'm used to do to to. member of the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, and the Human Rights Subcommittee, by the way, um, because I, I believe that no matter how important are our relations uh, and our differences and our discrepancies with Iran, namely on human rights, the relationship with Iran is important and has to be um, uh, developed, especially now that we have the JCPOA, the agreement on the nuclear program. It's very central in the European policies towards Iran. It's an important element for the security, not just of the region, but actually of the world. And therefore, we need to keep dialogue with Iran. Of course, in many issues, we'll have totally different point of views. But we keep talking, we should be keep talking, and maybe about human rights. That is a different attitude from the one that NEK advocates here. And I, uh, I must say that I had never heard about NEK until I became a member of the European Parliament in 2004. Never heard. And I have dealt a lot with Iran and with Iraq in, as a diplomat in the UN Security Council, namely in the, the UN Commission on Human Rights. A lot. So it's weird that I had have heard about uh, NEK. And I only. Uh, I heard once I came here and was, uh, uh, like many other members, immediately uh, um, uh, 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 object of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 an approach by MEK supporters, pretending to be uh, vocal human rights uh, campaigners for Iran, uh, but actually acting in a way that really started raising my doubts. And that those lots were confirmed when I actually was the author of a report about human rights and about EU relations with Iraq. This was the time uh, that uh, was a report that I wrote in 2007-2008 that led to Iraq a couple of times. And uh, every time uh, 
at that time it looked like it's, the report was about Iran. No, it wasn't about Iran. But still, the NEK was very much interested in that and was sort of making the relations with Iraq hostage as well of their perception about the relations with Iraq. <coughs> And uh, there were, when I prepared the first draft, there were lots of amendments coming from several colleagues who, who reflected those views. At that time, I was able to test with many of my Iraqi interlocutors, civil society as well as authorities, and actually uh, learn that this was a time when there was Camp Ashraf as a result of the action that the, the MEK had had as a tool of Saddam. Uh, you're saying against Iran, and uh, I, I learned how that had nothing to do with the relations with Iraq, was a, re a real problem in the relations between Iraq and Iran. And it's what's, what's so interesting is that even the Americans were very much against these comments. And I remember that at that time I received the visit of an assistant secretary of state of George W. Bush, who came all the way here to <coughs> Brussels to tell me, among other things, regarding that report, which was, of course, very important for them, they were watching, that indeed uh, these amendments that have been put forward by several colleagues, which were about any case, were totally uh, inappropriate, and, and that any case was a dangerous organization. That was what was told to me by this man, Lawrence something, we can find his name, but I, I do remember that. And I, I, I find it so odd that I said, how come it's, they are dangerous, but still you are protecting them from <coughs> Camp Ashraf? And, and he replies that they, we are protecting them, but we are watching them as well. We know they are dangerous. And of course, soon after the, the, the transfer from Camp Ashraf to Camp Uriah started, um, we know very well what happened, uh, or many know, I, I think I know a bit what happened. I remember very well how then Ambassador Martin Kobler was uh, miserably attacked by the NEK, in the same way they attack me now, uh, and Patricia Moore, <laughs> uh, 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 because he was trying to indeed work out a solution that would uh, indeed transfer the NEK <coughs> members from, uh, from Iraq to elsewhere. And uh, uh, at that point, the, time, the big problems were having to do with uh, indeed the difficulty to have access by the UN to the members of NEK to find out what was indeed their wish. If they wanted to go to another country, if they wanted to be repatriated to Iran, if they wanted to go somewhere else and, and uh, get rid of uh, the NEK organization. Uh, they, these were the difficulties at that time. We heard a lot of reports by Mr. Kovla. Uh, the difficulties that we went had in interviewing individual members <coughs> of NEK because the organization would not simply allow uh, these normal interviews that the UNHCR in particular would be conducted. And by the way, I'm pleased to have here today, I know uh, Ms. Annabelle Roy Grandjean from UNHCR, who I think has accompanied the process. <coughs> Uh, so maybe at some point, if she would like to come in or if there is any question, maybe we can even ask uh, uh, Miss uh, on, on that question that she has for me. Um, recently, uh, while I was in this visit uh, to Iran by the Foreign Affairs and the subcommittee, uh, I got a message that victims of MEK would like to, to meet with me. And I, 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 uh, and, and, I, and I met in the hotel where I, we were staying. These uh, people came there to, to, to talk to me. These were uh, old ladies, uh, three old ladies, and in, in, in different ways they had been affected by what they uh, uh, think uh, were attacks by NEK to their family, to their relatives that they have lost, and some of them have stayed crippled to this day. I also met with two ex-members of NEK who came to see me and who came to, com to confirm, indeed, the tremendous difficulties to have to escape NEK and to uh, go through the, the very uh, pervasive uh, security uh, system that NEK has imposed on their members. Um, and I have learned from these people 
that actually, and two other people that I've received in the department, <coughs> that some people now in Albania are <coughs> uh, there against their will, not able to receive visits of relatives, not able to receive, to actually freely express their will to get rid of this organization. So it's, this is the reason why we talk of uh, MEK. We know MEK has a lot of money. It's not just probably the Saddam's money that has been that is left. It has also to do with other new sources of financing. I see here a statement made by number of my colleagues apparently warning against this mission, this uh, meeting today. And I see some of them, not all, but some of them coinciding with another list that recently opposed uh, 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 a meeting that I also, and tried to prevent a meeting that I organized here in this parliament on another topic, actually having to do with the Israeli occupation of Palestine. Mm, it might be a coincidence, it might not be, I don't care. Uh, anyhow, uh, I'm pleased that we are having this meeting here, in particular because this is a parliament where any key members seem to have full access. I see many of those people that I identify with MEK often here in the parliament, in particular in Strasbourg, when we have plenary, or when we have mini plenary or in Brussels. So it means that somebody is providing them with a credential so that they can stay all day and lobby here inside the parliament. I have been trying to identify who's providing these credentials for some time by actually asking the president of the parliament to identify who is providing those credentials for these people, because of course it's their opportunity to, to, to uh, be uh, uh, talking to members and at first citing themselves as uh, Iranian opposers. And, uh, and to me, probably the most important voice that here in this parliament dispel this notion that these people are uh, Iranian opposers that have some credibility with the Iranian people fighting for human rights, was actually the voice of Shirin Ebadi herself, whom I asked here in this parliament whether she would say that the MEK was indeed a genuine opposition against Iran. And she would very clear, in very clear terms, say that, uh, that this is not the case. There is no uh, credibility for this group at all in the eyes of the Iranian population, and in particular in the eyes of those who are fighting for human rights in Iran, like Ursa. Uh, recently, their presence uh, led to uh, Albania is a country that is negotiation accession to the EU. We hear that um, Ms. Vanucci, Vanuccini, she's a, a, a journalist from the Italian newspaper La Repubblica, could not uh, did miss her flight, so she cannot be with us today. But I'm very pleased to give the floor first to Mr. Nicola Pele. He's from the Rome-based Institute for Global Studies. I know that you've been participating in other meetings here in the Parliament in, in the subject, and also this one. So we're very pleased to listen to you. Please. Transcendentalist, what we call the intoxication of the political debate. This is exactly the point that I would like to go over in, uh, in my short speech. 
what we've seen uh, in, uh, in Italy, especially during the Berlusconi government, when, uh, as you remember, there was uh, uh, an open access to the MKO members and Maria Bradley in the parliament, uh, with the invitations in the parliament uh, and by other governmental bodies. Uh, the number of MPs which have signed these declarations or letter of support for uh, the organization uh, uh, increased dramatically. We had uh, almost 70% of the MP members, uh, which in a way the others, has signed the document uh, or supported directly or indirectly the group. And uh, talking to most of these members, uh, what we realized is that the vast majority of these MPs not even remember that they've met these guys or that they've supported them in some uh, uh, events. The, some of them remember that they've signed something, but they didn't remember what they've signed and which was the organization they were supporting. And uh, only a few, <coughs> and, and, uh, and uh, I can tell less than five uh, among those we have interviewed, uh, remembered and were uh, deliberately supporting the, the group and uh, uh, the, the, the adhere to what was written on this piece of paper. So the problem is that, as always happened also in the, with the previous parliaments, uh, we have the same phenomenon. So uh, basically the, the, the diffused ignorance uh, on, uh, on Iran issues in the parliament, and especially on the various groups which are rotating around the, the, the Iran or against Iran, uh, is uh, uh, providing a very fertile terrain for those who are approaching the peace and for those who are trying to use this initial support in order to extend the network inside the governmental institutions. What we fear is that these letters uh, have been used uh, in order to increase their capacity of penetration inside the institutions and trying to, uh, as I said, intoxicate the debate regarding uh, the uh, bilateral relation between, uh, the, between the Italian Republic and the Islamic Republic of Iran. This is one of the issues that we are uh, extremely concerned on, in the sense that uh, uh, fully support a country <coughs> the SUA. As you know, Italy has uh, very good relations with uh, Iran, uh, and uh, not, it's not only an economic partner, but it's also a quite strong political uh, uh, partner in, uh, in both the bilateral and multilateral dimension. And uh, of course, the debate over the JCPOA have been affected several times by the attempt from several groups to enter into this debate at various levels, from a, uh, at a political level, but not only. Just to give you an example, uh, there is an organization which I will not mention here, but which is uh, sending letters to all the companies which are working uh, in, uh, in Iran, or which are trying to work with Iran, uh, asking uh, for, uh, basically what they're asking is, you have seven days to provide us the name of your counterparts, the exact nature of your job in uh, Iran, the number of employees, uh, the, 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 the amount of money that you are putting on your bill, and uh, remember that you risk to be put on the list of companies which are blacklisted in, uh, in the international arena. So this is a private organization which is sending these messages to Italian companies, and not only Italian companies, trying to scare them to uh, uh, to, 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 to simulate to, 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 to be part of uh, a, a governmental environment or something which is bigger than a private uh, organization and uh, uh, having as an effect the capacity of scaring most of these companies which have been uh, 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 the, the, they were asking the government and, and the police the, 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 these forces, uh, clarification regarding the nature of the group uh, behind this letter and the, 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 the nature of threat they were facing, uh, not answering to the requests uh, which were specified in, this, uh, in these letters. And uh, this is just one of the examples that I would like to bring uh, in terms of the, kind of the, the risk that uh, we are facing in terms of what we call intoxication. But there is also the political intoxication, so the capacity of bringing inside the parliament, bringing inside the commissions, bringing inside the overall political debate, the idea that dealing with the Islamic Republic of Iran is risky or even uh, worse, could be uh, 
the bring in Italy on the brink of a conflict or being involved in other kind of accusations uh, with, with, with respect to uh, the, 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 the support of uh, uh, the criminal government. Well, this is something that had an impact in certain political groups, had an impact in certain uh, environment inside the parliament, uh, uh, had an impact on the media, and uh, bringing these experience uh, 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 larger scale over the Albanian case, what I've seen in Albania uh, since the beginning of their presence there is that they are trying to replicate the model exactly as it was in Italy. They're approaching MPs, they're approaching journalists, they're approaching uh, opinion makers, they're approaching all those who have the capacity of uh, playing a role or influencing the political and social debate in the country. In a country which is very small, with uh, uh, a lot of problems, not only economics, we are talking about uh, uh, several security problems coming from uh, the, 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 the Balkan regions, where there are groups which are connected with international jihadism. So Albania is a particular case. We are not talking about Italy. We are talking about a country which is risking to be involved in something which could be detrimental to the national interest. And the political debate has been affected by the presence of the Mujahideen Akal. Since the beginning of the arrival, what I've seen is that uh, two or three years ago, basically, very few Albanians uh, uh, even remember the name of the group. Now there is uh, a, 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 a bigger debate on their presence, uh, the, 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 uh, a larger knowledge of their role, or the, of their presence, and there is a capacity of uh, uh, affecting the political debate in the parliament with information, with uh, data, with uh, uh, pieces of, of, uh, of economic and political information which are of course, produced in, uh, in a way to derail uh, the interest of the country uh, toward the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. The problem of Albania is that we have uh, a camp. We have uh, uh, not only a community living in the country, we have a huge amount of people which is, uh, uh, again, active uh, as, uh, as a group in, uh, inside the country. Uh, they have been given a facility, a former university building, which is, uh, is used by this group, and uh, there is a capacity of uh, uh, bringing this, uh, the, 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 this group into the, 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 the political and social environment, uh, interacting with, uh, with the local uh, political and, uh, and, uh, and social representative, producing an effect uh, which is in this moment uh, risking uh, to uh, affect the capacity of the government in judging his own position with regard to not only international affairs, but security in the region and most in particular security in the region. Well, just one clarification from uh, our own experience, and I, I don't know if this applies also for Albania. One of the questions that we are always trying to, to, to answer when we have dealt with, uh, with this group in Italy is, which is the final goal, which is the objective of this group, because as, uh, as Gomez uh, correctly said, there's no future for them in Iran. They have an horrible reputation in Iran. There's no future for them inside the country. There's no capacity to uh, access uh, the Iranian society as a political or as an, a political alternative in, uh, in the country. There's no capacity, uh, in my opinion, at an international level to play a role bigger than the one they're playing today. Uh, so they, they, they could affect the capacity uh, of certain uh, political environment uh, in the European Parliament and in local parliaments in Europe, but not more than this probably. Uh, of course, creating damages, but, uh, but, but not uh, uh, probably at the larger scale. So, which is the final goal of the group? What are they uh, the, the, the driving for? And uh, the idea that we have that the final goal is the status quo, is keeping things as they are in order to keep power, in order to keep money, in order to keep the irrelevance, without escalating too much in a certain sense, uh, without entering into a debate uh, which could uh, harm uh, the, uh, the, 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 the multilateral and, and bilateral debates over Iran. So this is probably where they are willing to put themselves in, uh, in the space, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a context where they can keep their 
uh, their capacity, they can keep their own capacity of influence, they can keep their capacity of uh, uh, affecting the political debate, but without moving uh, into other directions, because this would be extremely risky, and this would prove that there's no real future for the group, and there's no space for the group outside of this dimension. And this is risky, because uh, having such a large group of people in Albania, having such a large group of people in France, uh, the capacity of influence of the organization, it's uh, uh, unprecedented, it's, uh, it's a case by itself in Europe, uh, in the history of, uh, of this kind of organization, and uh, with uh, this cultish approach of the MKO, the, uh, the, 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 the level of threat posed at, in, in terms of capacity uh, of intoxicating the debate, it's in my opinion increasing uh, enormously, especially in this moment where, as we all know, the, uh, the, the multilateral debate over Iran is uh, entering into a very difficult phase. Uh, we are risking a conflict for the first time. Uh, I think there is a serious, concrete threat of a, of a conflict with Iran. And uh, the capacity of uh, affecting this political debate, the capacity of affecting our own national interest, our own uh, security in Europe, at a larger scale, at the global level, it's uh, in, in this moment uh, supported by the, the, the capacity of intoxica intoxication of the debate of the MKO. So that's why I fear that the Albanian experience uh, could be another element of threat which is uh, uh, affecting the overall European capacity of, of dealing with the group and with this organization. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, it's interesting what you say about the, the lists uh, that nobody can remind, uh, remembers having signed uh, in Italy, because here in the European Parliament, I'm still to find, trying to find out who are the more than, I think, uh, 400 members, 200 members that have been claimed by any key uh, and between the members of the European, among the members of the European Parliament, who have signed a declaration. I'm, I'm trying to find out who are these over 200 members. Uh, Vas, again, Mr. Tajani, our president, to find out who, who are these members. And to this moment, I didn't get any reply. Um, uh, and uh, now, uh, and thank you as well for uh, indeed uh, uh, warning about what is the, 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 the aim of uh, the group uh, uh, and. Uh, Considering indeed the very, very uh, narrow but vulnerable uh, uh, framework in which uh, the JCPOA uh, was uh, uh, establishing a, 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 an opportunity for dialogue between Europe and Iran, really uh, anything can very easily derail it. And considering, uh, of course, that there are. There is as well any other powers in the other or other uh, elements in the, the region that have uh, a, a particular antagonism towards Iran, and we saw, for instance, in uh, this visit that I, Foreign Affairs Committee, which I integrated, uh, included uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and included uh, uh, Kuwait. Uh, yeah, we can. Very well, I can very well understand what you are, the dimensions that you are warning me. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll open questions, so uh, we, I'm sure there will be questions to you. And then now I will give the floor to the next speaker, who is Mr. Olsi Yadjeshi, director of the Free Media Institute in Tirana. Hello. Uh, I, I have to come here because I want to show some slides with yes. the PowerPoint. So, let me do it. All right. <coughs> I don't need to speak. All right. All right, so everybody, my name is uh, Oyste Azadji. I come from uh, Tirana, Albania. <coughs> I did my PhD at the European University Institute for those people who might know it. And I'm specialized on issues of uh, uh, 
reformation of Islam, radical Islam, the Balkans. And I've been following the coming of the Iranian Mujahideens with very great attention in Albania since when our government made it uh, uh, public that they were bringing this group of people in Albania. As you can see from the picture, <laughs> here is Mariam Rajavi, <coughs> the head of the, this organization, and she's giving uh, cookies probably to a number of Albanian uh, politicians and MPs who think that uh, by going and attending the meetings with Mariam Rajavi, they are doing research <coughs> to America and to democracy. So the man with the uh, glasses here is Fasos Prosi, ex head of Albanian Secret Service. Mr. Prosi declared in 2016 that the <coughs> were a terrorist organization, but in 2017 he went and ate cookies with them. Uh, Mr. Astrid Veria is the head of a private university in Albania called Albanian University, and we have some other MPs and politicians. Now, the first group of the Mujahideens <coughs> came in Albania, Albania in 2013. There was a secret deal between the Obama administration and the government of Saudi Arabia, and in that time they brought around 250 Mujahideens in Albania. But this deal was kept in a way secret until in, on February 14, 2016. We had John Kerry coming to Tirana and he sealed a secret agreement with the Albanian government to bring the remaining 1,900 Mujahideens to Albania. This operation, which was managed by the UNHCR, uh, in our media was reported to have brought in Albania around 3,000 Mujahideens. Since 2014, the Mujahideens have recruited a number of Albanian politicians. I have to note here the present Albanian Minister of Diaspora. His name is Pandelin Maito. <laughs> he was ex-Minister of Defense of Albania during the era of Donald Rumsfeld when Albania hosted secret CIA prisons and tortured chambers. We have the example of a number of European uh, 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 citizens who were even tortured in Macedonia and in Albania, we had a German guy, I forgot yeah. his name. Al-Masri. Yeah, Al-Masri. And uh, Mr. Michael has never apologized for it. And uh, when the Obama administration, uh, uh, in a way, wanted to backtrack from the record of Rumsfeld and, and Bush, Mr. Uh, Michael said, no, we <coughs> don't apologize because we were at war and we did, did the right thing in the time. And Mr. Michael is, uh, is in the government of our uh, Prime Minister Eddie Rama often supports the Mujahideens and in their meetings he says I dream that one day we will march together and we will liberate Tehran and we will eat ice creams in Tehran. People even joke with Michael sometimes. Now, after coming to Albania, the Mujahideens, very strangely, <laughs> have started to recruit many Albanian politicians, musicians, students, civil society activists, even leftists, communists, and they call and they pay their, their, their trips, they pay their hotels and tell them, OK, let's go together to Brussels, to Rome, to Paris, and let's uh, protest against the dictatorship of Iran, because Iran is killing people, and we are the good Democrats who are going to save the world. Now, after coming to Albania, um, the Mujahideens, they allocated their people in mainly three areas of Tehran. <laughs> they had two major camps. One was at University Vitrina, which was listed them by an Albanian criminal. They are known as the Mark Brothers. They had made killings and prostitution here in Brussels a few years ago. And I think they are now serving their jail time for their crimes in Brussels here. Because, and they, were, they, they rented their, their premises to the Mujahideens. <coughs> and then they had even two other locations. Uh, however, what happened after the mass coming of the Mujahideens in Albania in 2000, <coughs> suddenly many of their members started to disappear. Together with my wife, who is a lawyer, we have had the chance to meet many of them. And many of them are people who simply uh, do not believe in jihad anymore. They simply want to abandon the jihad. They want to de-radicalize themselves. According to the latest Albanian police reports, <laughs> out of 3,000 NEC members that were at first announced to be in Albania in 2016, today we have around 2,745 of them. 
So we do not know what happened with 255 of them. We know that many of them have left for the European Union, have taken the side <coughs> under new names, and some might be even here in Brussels. Now, Albanian police reports <coughs> indicate that 11 members, at least this is what Mujahideen will be there, have died. 80 have left the country with regular papers. 65 were illegally removed from the country. And we have 124 people who have defected their organization and live a free life in Albania. The people who are still loyal to the organization of Rajavi, at least people who pay their lip service to her because she provides them with money and without money they die, are 2,621 people. Uh, worried by the great uh, number of deserters, Matt has taken many of their members out of Tirana and they have located them in a new camp called the Manus Camp in Duras, which is uh, uh, around 32 uh, hectares, square hectares, and many people who have tried to approach the camp, they are not allowed by the Albanian civil service, but some people who make the construction, etc., they say they have been given helipads, which means they are going to have helicopters <coughs> there. <coughs> now, uh, with the coming of the Mujahideen, we had a number of problems that we faced in Albania. Uh, first of all, our public was very angry when they came to Albania uh, because our, I mean, <coughs> our people, they do not want jihadists. I mean, they are afraid of Islamic terrorism. And when they came, there was a media outburst. Many people were attacking the government. They were accusing the Rama government, was telling to him, you wanted first to bring the, the, uh, the chemical weapons of Assad. Now you're bringing the Mujahideens. Uh, Parallel with the Mujahideens, we had another problem in, in, in Europe, and in uh, Southeastern Europe, as you all may know, and that was the radicalization of some Muslims <coughs> who joined the jihad in Syria. <coughs> the American and European partners of Albania have, de have uh, demanded from our government to set up their radicalization programs and punish people who call for violent jihad against foreign countries. From 2012 to 2014, some 100 Albanians have joined the jihad in Syria. In coordination with the American government, the Albanian parliament changed in April 2014 its penal code and created the necessary framework for the incarceration of people who want to join violent jihads in foreign countries. And according to the new law that we have, it is punishable in Albania from 15 to uh, years to uh, life in prison if somebody wants to join the jihad. In its uh, fight against uh, jihadism, uh, our government even uh, arrested nine Albanian sympathizers of the Syrian jihad in 2014 and, uh, uh, and uh, convicted them with jail time of around 126 years. But what is the irony now? <coughs> While the Albanian government uh, goes after Albanians who want to join the jihad in Syria, and sometimes some of the people who have been jailed, they didn't even go, they, some, uh, we have some cases in the court of them who they didn't even make any declaration praising Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi or the jihad. Our government doesn't implement the law when it comes to the Iranian jihadists. The Iranian jihadists that we have in Albania, they are exactly like the Wahhabi or the Salafi jihadists who have, who wanted to make a regime change in Syria. Uh, uh, what we see in Albania in, a, in a, every three months, let us say, we have uh, American uh, senators who come to Albania, or sometimes the, 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 the Iranian jihadists, they make big gatherings with some of our politicians, and they call for regime change and jihad against Iran. And the big question that our civil society and many journalists make in Albania is, and we ask our government, why do not you implement the law against these people who go uh, against the penal code of Albania? Another big problem that we have with the Iranian Mujahideen is that while Albania nowadays has uh, war refugees from Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Palestine, and when these people come to Albania, they want to integrate into society, these people do not want to integrate in the society. In 2016, I took a, a part in a TV debate in Top Channel, which is the biggest channel in Albania, and debated with ex-Minister of Foreign Affairs of Albania, Madame Harjit. 
And I told her why you're bringing this jihad organization to Albania. Her argument was that the deal of the Albanian government with the Americans was that we're going to help these poor war refugees save themselves from Iran, Iraq, etc. I told her, Madam, you're not going to do this thing. These people are going to come to Albania. They will not integrate. We are not bringing them here for humanitarian purposes. These people are going to commit terrorist acts in the future. At the time, proved that I was right. These people, they are not integrating in our society. They live in a paramilitary camps. Their leader, Mariam Rajavi, every day breaks the penal code of Albania and calls for making jihad against a foreign country. But our government <coughs> does not go after them. The double standards of the Albanian government towards its local radicalized Sunni Muslims who want to join the jihad in Syria and the Iranian Mujahideens who want to make jihad in Iran has led many uh, Sunni Albanian imams and commentators in Albania to question why does the Albanian government allow the Iranians to do jihad but not us to do jihad in Syria? Another big problem that we're facing <coughs> in Albania is that the Iranian uh, Mujahideens they are blackmailing our media. In uh, November 2017, <coughs> we had Ms. Ankhodabane, who she now has been, I mean, uh, our media, they are horrified by her because the Mujahideen attack her more than they attack uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, and they claim that she's an Iranian agent, etc. And uh, when uh, Ms. Khodabane has come two times in Albania, but the uh, Mujahideen claim that she has come three times, she came in November and she went to our local media stations and there are some interviews about who these people are. And she even wanted to have a debate with them. These people never debate. They do not believe in an open and free society. But what they did, Ms. Kodabande, she went to Ora News and she went also to uh, Tema uh, uh, TV. On the next day when they learned that she was there, they went to their office, they knocked in their door, they told them we are the Mujahideens, we are the CIA. You delete her video, you do not air her interview, or otherwise you will be in a big mess. When I saw that, it was crazy. In Albania, we can say anything. We can insult Trump, we can insult our prime minister, but the Mujahideen were so strong as they are even above law. In February 2018, <coughs> when we had three Mujahideen defectors who they are complaining, they are going to police stations in Albania because the MEC members are threatening them with death. And we have a report by our, by our police who are saying we have to protect these people because they might, they might be killed. So they went to Top Channel TV. And uh, there is an investigative uh, program like Leyene in Italy, it's, which is called Fix Fire. And they, they, they went and they said, listen, we have been with these guys, now we're out. The UNHCR doesn't support us. We were Mujahideens. We want to deradicalize ourselves. We are trained on suicide bombing, on this and that. We, we want your society to help us. Uh, what the Mujahideen did is <coughs> they attacked the top channel and they said the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the religious fascism of Iran got both top channel. So if you have a media station in Albania and you dare even to make a debate against the Mujahideen, they will accuse you as being an agent of Iran. They will accuse you as being bought by Iran. They will, uh, I mean, and these people never debate. Because this is what even I hope Madame Rajam is going to see us. We please we ask her come and debate with us. These people they do not even accept to debate. Uh, there is even another dimension of their presence in Albania. They are blackmailing our intellectuals. You, as you can see in this picture, in March 2003, we had the ex-president of Albania, <coughs> Mr. Rajab Meidani. He went to Tehran for a conference on uh, Naif Rashi, who is a national poet of Albania. The Mujahideens, when they saw these pictures, they said, they made a press release, they said, Tehran is recruiting uh, uh, Albanian intellectuals and scholars. It is crazy. <coughs> People, intellectuals, are, they are even afraid to go and, and participate in conferences in any country that the Mujahideens do not want. <coughs> what the Mujahideens do a lot is that they produce fake news. You probably can see this picture, and uh, Ms. Gomez is in this picture. And they are speaking, they, 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 they make fake press releases, they say it all, and they distribute it to our media in Albania. And for this meeting that we are doing now in this European Parliament, in the very heart of Europe, they are saying 
uh, uh, Tirana is in danger of terrorist attacks because we are talking about Madame Rajavi here in Brussels. Can you imagine? My God. They are bringing even a lot of religious tolerance in Albania. <laughs> As uh, many of you might know, Albania is a country of religious tolerance. We have uh, diverse uh, uh, religious communities there. But what the Mujahideens did to us this November 22, 2017, if you can see this is Baba Mondi, this is a big uh, <laughs> dervish uh, of the Bektashi tolerant Sufi sect. He is even goes to Yad Vashem and Israelis love to make pictures of him. But what the uh, Mujahideens did, because uh, every, every Nobrus, the Bektashis, they celebrate the birthday of Nima Mali, and they had invited people from all over, from Russia, Uzbekistan, and they had even two Iranian journalists from Iran. They told to our government, these journalists, they are agents of Iran, and our government <coughs> sent anti-terror police, they broke the religious ceremony of the Bektashis. Baba Mondi went nuts because he said, these people have been invited officially by me. He sent his papers to our foreign minister, our foreign minister gave them the visa. And they kept these two old Iranian journalists, and then, of course, they released them because they were innocent. But Baba Mondi had to call the president himself, who is a Bektashi, and said, what is going on in this country? In that day, together with my wife, we went to the police station because we wanted to see what was going on. And Baba Mondi and the, the Bektashi, they had to send their secretary there and tell them to them, please do not shame us with our guests. But our government, who want to praise the, 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 the Americans, I mean, they think that by obeying to the cult of Maria Rajavi, by turning Albania into a jihadistan, they will make John Bolton and John McCain and whoever very happy. And look, I mean, they produce so much fake news. You see what the EU reporter is, is reporting today, saying Iranian agents in the European Parliament politically cover for terrorist acts against the opposition in Albania. They produce so much fake news. These people, they do not believe in democracy. What should we do with the Mujahideens? I think that we should force and the European Parliament, who has a lot of power and leverage over Albania, should ask the Albanian government to force the Mujahideens to abandon their violent jihad, to integrate them to our society, and to accept the values of democracy. The Mujahideens must end in Albania the campaign of intimidation, terrorist calls, lies, disinformation, fake news that they are doing out of Albania, and this is very worrying. In Albania, the Mujahideens must abandon and dismantle their paramilitary organization. <coughs> and if Madame Rajavi and people who work for her, and like Stephen Stevenson, who had even mentioned me today by name, or Alejo Vidal Quadras, I don't know, some, some kind of name who nobody knows who they are. Okay. I mean, if, if, they, if they have any problem with what we say, they should be with us in a democratic way. Let them come and let us debate. We believe in a Europe of democracy, of free values, and not in a Europe of jihad and terrorism. The European Union where we live in is a continent of democracy, human rights, freedom of thought, and pluralism. Please, I, 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 I ask you as European members, please put the utmost pressure that you can on the Albanian government to save Albania from this very strange the terrorist call that we have. Thank you. if you can convey to me the notes on which you spoke because I will make sure that our colleagues dealing with Albania and the report on Albania, our rapporteur, the colleagues in the area, get to know this and of course uh, we get to uh, ask questions about what is happening. Now I will give the floor to Ms. Vigena Bala. I understand you're a lawyer from BNB Studio Legal in Tirana. So, uh, and we, you have you have direct knowledge of the legal problems the Mujahideens are facing in Albania. So please, you have it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Megina Bawa. I'm a practicing lawyer based in Tirana, as you mentioned. After the coming of the Mujahideen in Albania, I have been in contact with them uh, because uh, there are some of them who want to leave the group and they want to be uh, free people and to be uh, civilians in Albania. But they don't find any way how they can deal with the life in Albania. So
So they asked me to uh, to find a way for them, a legal way for them, how they can work in Albania, how they can live in Albania. Uh, so uh, it was a new case for me. Uh, usually I deal with uh, immigration of foreigners coming to Albania, but uh, for business purposes, not refugees and not humanitarian purposes. Uh, so uh, I find out that we have a lack of legal uh, uh, laws, uh, a lack of laws in Albania for this group, and they have a special treatment for this group. So what can I do? And uh, what I did, I tried to contact UNHCR as an organization who has the uh, right and the duty to protect these people. It was very difficult to contact them. Uh, we tried to fix an appointment through uh, via email or via telephone. They didn't respond to us. So we even contact their office in Geneva. And we are saying to them that uh, we cannot uh, make an appointment to ask this organization what they are doing for these people who are leaving the organization and they don't have any economic or legal status in Albania. Uh, then uh, we find a way to uh, some people we know uh, to fix an appointment with the director of the refugees there in Albania. Okay, uh, with us was one of the persons you see their documents. Uh, <coughs> he came with us. He, he's an um, ex uh, NPO member who speaks English. And uh, we, uh, we showed the problem, everything they had in Albania, how they deal with the life, the problems they have there. And this director said that we cannot do anything for them. All what we can do for them is to offer them some food, simple food and a shelter only for six months. So if you are an NPO member and you want to leave the group, you can go to UNHCR and ask them for food only for six months. And I'm saying, what will happen after six months? Where does people can go? And he has no answer. He's saying that they have to, to find a way along. And they are uh, saying that the Benin government doesn't have any clear status for them. They are preparing uh, what to do and the agreement between uh, USA, uh, the Benin government, and MPO is being secret. <coughs> Nobody knows. What is this agreement? Uh, what are their rights? What they can do in Albania? What they cannot do in Albania? So, uh, even UNHCR, they, uh, they uh, keep their role like indifferent in this uh, problem. They don't want to deal with this problem. And they leave these people in mercy of faith. So how they are living? Their families are helping them. Who is lucky has a good family, a rich family in Iran, sends him some money to live in Albania. And who is not lucky? They are from them that I met them and interviewed them. Uh, uh, some of them, they, they slept even in the street sometimes because they don't, they don't afford to rent a house and to live in a house in Albania. And the uh, Albanian government doesn't care because they are saying that uh, the organization has the custody of them. They have to provide them food and uh, shelter and houses and everything, financial help and everything. So. Uh, I'm saying to them, why don't stay in your organization if you have some money from them? Some of them, they're saying they take like 600 euros from the organization. Some, they say 400. Uh, it's not clear because I'm asking them, how do you get this money? Do you have a bank account? They're saying, no, we just sign in some lists. So how this money is coming in Albania? Who is controlling that? That is difficult now to bring money in Albania and not be in control. Where does this money go? Uh, they are saying to us about uh, the difficult life 
and how the human rights are not respected, being respected at all from this organization. This organization can, can send them out uh, if they try, <coughs> try a little bit to contact with an Albanian citizen to ask him for uh, help to contact their family in Iran or somewhere in Europe where they are. Uh, they have spies everywhere and they, they can spy the members if they try to contact their families or relatives everywhere in the world via internet. So if you contact them, you are out of the group without money and without anything. Another thing they told me is that uh, they make a big propaganda that uh, everyone is, who is protecting the, the ex mujahideens talking in the media, or me as a lawyer, or my husband, everyone, uh, they are accusing us Iranian agents. Everyone is being accused like that. And uh, we have seen, as Olsi mentioned, that even uh, our deputies or uh, important people in Albania are being accused without any fact. And nobody is saying anything about that. This is fake, or how you dare to accuse Albanian or uh, people in my country, you are here, you are not Albanian, and you are coming in my country and accusing me as being Iranian agent. I don't care what happens in Iran, I care what happens in my country. And uh, from these people I learned that uh, my country is not controlling if uh, this organization is doing legal activity in Albania. Because calling for war against another country, a third country, is against the law. And doing, pol uh, doing political activity against another country in a third country is also against the law. Against the law. And also coming uh, uh, American representatives, as Giuliani last month came in Albania, and he openly declares war toward Iran and told this group, please let me listen, uh, please say it loudly, free Iran, let's go and free Iran. He is making these calls uh, among the Mujahideens and they are doing these calls in my country. So, why they are doing this in my country? In a country who wants to be a EU, a EU member, uh, this is the point. So, I cannot find as a lawyer that my country is respecting the conventions and uh, the refugee convention, especially for these people, because uh, they have to be free to travel, they have to be free to move, they have to be free to have a family, to get married. They are not allowed to have a family and to get married. This is forbidden in this group. And so, how this group can provide democracy for other people if they don't have democracy inside their group? So, even, even my government, how this uh, country can provide to them a, a civil life and a normal life if they don't have a work permit, if they don't have a travel document, they don't have any passport, they came to Albania by list, they, uh, they, their passport was uh, uh, confiscated by the organization once they joined that. So uh, they, they cannot go anywhere in the world without documents. They cannot work in Albania. They cannot even open their own business in Albania because our government with legal status that gave to them these ordinary papers, they cannot do anything. So they are being forced to stay in the group not to leave the group, if against their will. This is against the, their will. So if we analyze this fact, we can see that this is like a prison, a big prison. And this prison is happening in front of our eyes. We can see the, the big camp that they are building in our uh, country. And uh, they are not allow, allowed to get out. They have a timetable. They have to, uh, to be at 6 o'clock in that camp and not get out. They have to go only in specified places. They cannot go in shops or everywhere they want. 
they have always to be uh, with a friend that is different. It's not a friend, it's just a spy maybe, who spies where they are going. So this happened in front of our eyes. We see them training in the streets of Tirana. They are running every day. They are being trained every day. And how can I imagine that this group is not being military group still in my country? And they are not doing military activities still in my country because this camp is so close. They don't let any media, anyone, to get in the camp and see how they are living, what they are doing. So uh, another thing that I want to mention is that I have been contacted from their relatives who live in Italy, one of them. He came to, to meet a relative who is a member of MAC. And once he came in Tirana, he was detained by the police. And police is helping. It's helping the organization to keep these people as members and not to let them free. And police, what they do, even the, the ex-members are being survived uh, from the police. Once a month or once a week, they call them to the police station just to, to make pressure to them, just to, not to let them free to live like other people. And they are like afraid, like scared for everything. Even when they contacted me, they are watching. Is anybody watching them? They are so scared to, to move, to walk in the streets of my city. And for that, the police is making a, a big role in this history and helping the Rajavi organization to, to keep these people uh, as prisoners, I can say. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm leaving down. I, I think it was clear the situation. I hope that uh, you can do something this uh, to change in my country. Thank you. very brave to come here and speak to us and let us know what, what is the situation as you are leaving it as Albanian citizens concerned with the implications for your own country and, and the implications for the people that, as you said, are somehow hostages to this uh, rule. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, some of the questions you have put, we will definitely, Patricia and I, will put them uh, Mainly to our interlocutors in the, in the relations with Albania. Definitely, these are very, very relevant, mainly indeed to know on what terms was this agreement made between the US and Albania, and what is the role that Albanian authorities are playing in not in helping people who need and help for them, but actually in helping those who are retaining them as hostages. Uh, let's now turn to uh, Miss uh, Anne Kodabanda, yes, uh, I hear that, uh, uh, I know uh, her name uh, comes prominently. By the way, the photographs that were shown are photographs that I took, uh, that I allowed it, they are public, I don't hide anything that I do. Uh, I myself put out uh, photographs of my own meetings in Tehran with the victims uh, of MEK. Uh, I put them on Twitter, so nothing is secret. I don't do anything secret. My uh, the photographs are part two. What is the, the, the story that they tell about these photographs? Of course, I cannot control. But uh, uh, these photographs are not uh, doctored, so to say. <coughs> they are real photographs that I allowed it to be taken. Uh, so uh, Miss Singleton has been uh, uh, Miss Singleton Kunabanda has been indeed uh, uh, pointed out as an agent of the. Uh, Iranian secret services by these people. Uh, I'm probably under your orders, so I'm very happy <laughs> to hear you. <laughs> you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. How um, to follow that? Um, okay, so uh, it's, it's uh, every pres presenter in my event to find out that half the presentation is actually being covered by the other speakers. However, that makes it easier because I can skip on a bit faster here. Um, lots of people in this room know me. It's close to you. Sorry. Yeah. So lots of people know me, but for those who don't, I spent 20 years from the age of 19 um, 
there were deaths by natural causes, suicide and murder, and a lot of the graves um, uh, you know, kind of have shown us that people that they said were murdered uh, was committed suicide and actually murdered and, and such like. Um, so from 3,800, uh, and, and don't worry, I will do the maths for you, but there's a bit of sort of jiggling about with the numbers here. So a total of 2,901 individuals were relocated to Albania over the course of the three years. Um, this, and I've put this, this, um, uh, this text on just to show the sources. This is UNHCR's official um, uh, figures. At the end of 2016, uh, 2,745 uh, were left in Albania. So that means that um, 156 left in that period between September and December. Uh, note as well that the um, <coughs> said many individuals were in need of medical care, um, hence people dying. Um, the Mujahideen have uh, used the excuse in Iraq that a lot of their members died because there was no medical care for them. Well, there is medical care in Albania in abundance, so they have no excuse whatsoever um, to, to deny medical care for their members. Um, then, um, the police report, which our speaker uh, obviously uh, mentioned, um, they, they, this report takes that number, 2,745, from the end of 2016. I don't think anyone knows at this present time how many there are in, that, in, in the camps, in the country. Uh, this is how the majority operate, they traffic their members, they traffic them in, they traffic them out. Who comes with Marion Majabi, who leaves with her, we don't know. Um, this report says that at this time, 11 members have died, now we know there are 16 graves, there's bound to be more. 80 have left the country with regular papers. I don't know what that means, our last speaker was explaining that when the people came from Iraq, they had no legal status, they weren't refugees, they didn't have passports, they had a piece of paper which said they'd been transited for humanitarian reasons. That's not a legal document, it's just something to flash at the immigration um, department. When they arrived, or since they have arrived in Albania, they have no legal status in the country at all. Um, we, and, and for that reason, they're not registered anywhere. So we don't know the numbers, we don't know how many there are. Um, and I'm sure that you get it correct me if I'm wrong about that, that we don't know actually who they are. Um, 65 were illegally removed. I'm not entirely clear what that means. I suppose they were smuggled out or either they found their own way or Mujahideen took them out. So um, Mujahideen will continue to be four members, 2,621 people who have left. 124. Um, I, I won't blame the um, police in Albania for their maps. Um, 2,745 minus 280 is 265, uh, not the 2,621. Uh, 2, anyway, that, that's just a minor um, uh, discrepancy, but it, it does demonstrate that even the police don't know who they are, how many there are. Um, so, this is again from the police uh, reporting on, on the neck behaviour in um, Albania. They started to move their members to um, a camp, uh, which previously I mentioned in Manas Duras, uh, which is um, a fairly remote place. Um, and from November 2017, they began to transfer all the rank and file to that camp. And it's a closed camp. It's, they call it Ashraf 3 because that um, is their third camp. Um, it's, it's just kind of for their own um, internal uh, brainwashing purposes, let's say. So, okay. Do these ma numbers matter? Um, they matter if you think it's important to actually keep track of them, who they are, what they're doing. Uh, one of their advocates, Senator Robert Torricelli, um, says that there are over 4,000 men in Camp Ashashri. Well, that's rather disturbing because you either have 2,000 
400 and something, or you have 4,000? Well, who are they? Where did they come from? We, the, the simple truth is we don't know. We don't know who's there at all. Uh, we, we know who's there because we know the membership, but we don't know exactly who they are. Um, so, does it matter <coughs> how many they are? The police, again, they assess this group at uh, the beginning of their arrival as deeply indoctrinated. They've been part of military structures. They have participated in fighting a war, the Iran Iraq war, uh, and, and also they've been taking part in acts of terror. So the, the police in Albania are fully aware of who this group are. However, um, under this secret agreement, which our previous speakers, uh, speakers talked about, they, they, uh, Americans had said they were going to set up uh, an institute, a de-radicalization institute. Now, I went and I spoke to um, uh, an official in the British Embassy in Tirana, and he said, oh, yes, I know, I know um, who's in charge of that. The budget's there, but they just haven't done it. So they have not de-radicalized these people. Um, and the Mujahideen have not only de-radicalized, they've actually regrouped as a group in a closed camp <coughs> in an isolated area. Fortunately, there are many people in Albania who are interested in this uh, enough to do a lot of investigative work. Um, our friends here who follow their cases. There is an investigative journalist, uh, Jerzy Thanasi, who discovered the in discrepancies in the legal work um, of the Mujahideen building uh, accounts. So they didn't have legal permits, they haven't paid any tax. Basically, they, they work in Albania is illegal. Um, they also have uncovered links, not just to corrupt politicians, but to mafia bosses as well. Um, it, which in itself should worry anybody um, who would be matching one terrorist criminal group with a bunch of uh, mafia boxes. Probably not a good idea. But most disturbing of all uh, that he, he kind of came across was that um, America has plans to bring more radicalized folk and de radicalize them. In this case, they're going to bring widows and orphans of Daesh fighters um, who've been killed so that their uh, husband and wife have been killed. Uh, and they're going to bring them to Albania. Um, and this is why we, we think this is one of the reasons when they, they hurried up to move them out of the uh, university buildings in Tirana and, and send them to this camp, so leave space. These are um, pictures taken by the television um, uh, journalists who were trying to follow their case, and as our speaker said, they were they were actually banned from, or they, they were prevented from broadcasting. Uh, the first picture of the uh, the window in Tirana, that's how they lived. They closed their curtains. They lived behind closed doors. They they were not allowed out. They were um, under supervision the whole time, and so the local populations were very kind of um, suspicious and, and quite wary about who they were. Since they've gone to the camp, um, you can see this building work going on. Slide below. Um, the journalist is saying this is as close as we can get. This is how close we can get to this camp. So we don't actually know what's happening in there. The, the journalist I was saying, uh, he also um, got the documents for the planning commission from the local um, land registry. So when they got planning permission for this building, the building included not just a helicopter, it included a three and a half meter perimeter wall, which is huge, uh, with guard turrets, so that they can actually guard the perimeter of the camp. Um, a small arms firing range, a reinforced concrete armory, um, and at the end of the day, the mech guard the, gap, the camp. There is no uh, they will not allow anybody in the camp without permission, and they will not allow anybody into the camp without um, an escort. So even even the security services of Albania will not have free range to go into the camp and find out who's there, what they're doing. Um, and as we know, the net can't leave without permission. Um, so they're trapped in there. Because they're trapped in there, um, and even when they try to come out, um, they have such enormous problems. 
we are, are concerned about their futures. Um, like Mujahideen throughout their, their um, existence almost, the people who are living in this camp are living in a state of modern slavery, and, and I do not um, understate that, I must, I must emphasize they are actual slaves. And what that means, in, in essence, is that the people who come to the European Parliament and they approach MPs and they do the lobbying work are actual slaves. So you might be familiar in uh, Europe with you know, sex slaves and this <coughs> growing slaves and such like, but these are what we call political slaves. They belong to a political genre, as it were, uh, but they don't get paid and they have no uh, rights, they don't have holidays, pensions, healthcare. Uh, uh, many of you are familiar with the conditions that the Mujahideen um, live in. No family relations of the world, no contact. In, in fact, you can just say that every single human right in the, uh, in the Declaration of Human Rights is, is denied to them, uh, freedom of thought and so on. So we know that most MET members would like to leave. They would leave if they have somewhere to go. They don't have anywhere to go. Um, under this secret agreement, they are not um, given support from either the Albanian states or the support from the UNHCR is, is very limited. Um, I contacted the, um, the International uh, Organization for Migration because I thought, well, somebody has to be responsible for them. Somebody. If it's not the UNHCR, they are People who have been taken, they're, they're third country residents, so they've been taken from a, third, a second country, not their own, to a third country. Who's responsible for them? Who, who is going to actually take responsibility? Now, the MET leaders keep them there, under, under, uh, in their camps, uh, with imprisonment, just physical imprisonment, coercion, psychological manipulation, um, and they're... they're keeping just about two and a, well, under two and a half thousand members in, in Albania. But why keep them? Why keep them why, under such conditions? Is it not just better to let them go home to their families and, you know, have a normal life? And I would say that the, the two thousand members are providing cover for around 50 highly radicalized activists in Mujahideen who are prepared to die for their cause and kill for their cause. And so we don't know who they are. Those 50 people who are they, we don't know. They're not fingerprinted, they have no legal documents, we can't actually go after them. And why they're there? Regime change. It's, it's, it's their raison d'etre. Um, and, and they believe in violent regime change. So that's what they're there for. And I would just say, well, Mary gradually can do as she likes. She can have people killed, she can send people here, there, and everywhere. But in the bigger world, in Albania, in Europe, who's actually responsible for the world? <coughs> who's actually, whatever they do, who answers for them? That's the Thank you so much for the <laughs> interesting uh, information and questions. And I will now, since we are running short, we have 15 minutes uh, of the room available. Uh, so I'm running short to Mr. Uh, Reza Jebeli, who has been uh, bringing to me several relatives of people kept hostage there. And I see some uh, here along this table. Uh, you, have the, uh, you are the last speaker before uh, Patricia. Uh, uh, offers a closing remark. So I would ask for you to Thank you. Sure. Sure. All right, I'm, I'm trying to make this. Thank you, sure. First of all, I would like to thank you, Ms. Uh, Gomez. Like this. Uh, 
Since I was escaped from MEK, I was uh, threatened by uh, MEK that they would kill me. And, and this uh, organization, the Mafia Counter Organization, with uh, spending a lot of money, they can do whatever they want. And we also see that Maria Benjamin will come here and talk about freedom and democracy and human rights and uh, uh, freedom for women. <coughs> and the way they treat us, uh, the way they treat us is not the best. Thank you. Uh, I am very frequent in Albanian TV stations, they call me Dunnets. We don't have freedom. And unfortunately, the European Union is not really present in Albania to tell Albania to stand up on its feet and to look after its own interest and our interest as European, after all. And the thing is that uh, uh, this is a problem. I mean, we do not have, because our politicians are corrupt, Albania is one of the most corrupt countries in Europe, and they will do anything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just want to, to thank, uh, first of all, uh, Anna, which is the uh, like me, an uh, Iranian agent. <laughs> we have two Iranian agents in the panel. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm laughing, but uh, it, it's uh, very sad, very much so. Uh, thank you for, for organizing this prestigious uh, this, uh, this, uh, conference and uh, for inviting this prestigious guest. Everything has been, has been said, I think, this afternoon about what we need to know on the net, uh, which is dangerous for Iran, because they want to instill a radical Islamist Marxist regime that would be anything but in accordance with the democratic values that we demand in the, as MPs in the European Union, and which Iran needs. Thank you again, Anna, because this subject is only very rarely analyzed, debated, or simply mentioned here in the European Parliament, and more broadly in the European institutions concerning the threat that the make represent for Iran, for the Middle East, and therefore for our security within the European Union. And I just want to make a parenthesis to uh, explain, because myself, in 1990, and I was involved in the Mujahideen in Club, in front of the Mujahideen Club, well known uh, writer. And, and at that time, I was fighting for women's rights, and she told me it's terrible, the situation in, uh, in Iran, it's in the blah, blah, blah. And so uh, I accepted to work with her and the Mujahideen Club during uh, two years, and I was in I made conferences to explain how bad it was the Iranian with the Iranian uh, power with, uh, with the poor uh, Iranian women, and uh, even, even making a video of the lapidation of the, of the women. I, I, made, I made many conferences around France, 
with this issue. And uh, I was invited in a, in, in a demonstration, to go to demonstration in, the, in Paris. And one day I arrived at the demonstration and we were all obliged to be like this, like this. I see, and I have the feeling, I said, no, my God, it's not possible. I am in a sect. But the feeling, it was a feeling, nobody told me nothing about it. It was in 1998. I say it is, it is a sect here because we are all to, to shout one word and the other one. And it is part of the night that's like a sect. Well, I wonder when you part of them. I was helping my friend Tariba. And so I decided to go. I have another, for the time the Taliban arrived in, a, in, a, in Afghanistan, so I have another <laughs> subject to be to care, to care about. And uh, two, one year ago, I, and I cut with Fanny Bashkia, I, I met her, and one year ago I met her in, in Paris in a, in a restaurant, and she told me, oh, I finished with the Mujahideen from Mez a long time ago, this is a sect, that's a terrible, nothing with democracy, it is a totalitarian uh, uh, organization, and uh, so and now I am living in Tehran, and I think if you want to, uh, to have the same mood, you have to with inside the, the Saudi party <coughs> in Iran and not uh, with these, these, these people who are, who are the targets of the CIA or something. Uh, so, just like to explain my, my own, uh, my own uh, experiences with, with this group. So, uh, in front of Mega Present, they are instead in my constituency in the Paris region, their leader at that time. Marcel Massoud Rabbi uh, has set up there in the early 1980s. Uh, uh, members meet every year still in Paris region, bringing together tens of thousands of people. Like this was the case in July 2017 in Villepas, a French uh, city near Paris. <coughs> and the last, the last demonstration in Paris, Villepas, uh, the Albanian, I can't remember it was the last one before. The Albanian minister has been invited, uh, all the ministers, journalists, Albanian minister, and we were all wondering why the Albanian were invited. It was because of the agreement between uh, what the restaurant designers and the Ashraf and the way they have been, uh, the American accent that they have been accepted in, in, in Albania. So during a demonstration in Tehran last December, the next month, as a protest, and Tehran accused France of doing nothing against the men. As a result, the planned visit of Foreign uh, Minister Jean-Yves Le Drian to Tehran was postponed, while Emmanuel Macron is due to visit uh, Iran in October of this year. But above, above all, men have poisoned relations between France and Iran for too long. The support, even the financing of Saudi Arabia men, no longer surprised nobody today, while at this very moment the French president received in Paris Mohammed Ben Salman, leader of the country Saudi Arabia, to which one we continue to sell weapons, weapons a country which demonstrates Salafist ideology and finance terrorist groups are conducting a totally useless war in Yemen, a war that Saudi Arabia is losing and desperately seeking to get out of What is happening in Albania is worrisome because it is symptomatic of the sprawling and endless network that the MEC has developed over the last decades. And we can see today that the sectarian excesses of this organization threaten, threaten the social stability of the country. Albania, which had been recognized as a candidate country for the European Union in 2004. 14, so, sorry. We therefore simply cannot allow to let the main active in the Albanian society that is likely to rely to rally, to its called the young Albanian population, which seeks not to be locked in a regressive and valuable ideology that is totally beyond the south progress process of Albanian news. But as young people of the country seek to realize their dreams and find economic opportunities, that the opening of the European Union one day will hopefully bring to them. Thank you. So I think we have a lot to do with the European Parliament of Anna 
and, and so another thing I want to add is that at the time, you know, I am an MP since uh, one year. I arrived here last May. And I was shocked when I arrived here. The first thing I had under my, the door of my office, of my office, it was a paper to sign from the Mujahideen. I said, my God, they are still alive. I said, they are still alive. I flew from, from them still uh, 10 years ago. I said, no, I arrived in the town, but they are everywhere. With a little scarf like this, so we can put my hands. And so I, I, I told my assistant, uh, uh, I don't want to sign <laughs> no more paper about the uh, Iwaka. So, so I hope we can succeed to make, a, to make something, because for me it's a, a real scandal. At the time we are going, we, uh, you know, there is a GCPO arm that uh, uh, perhaps we will be uh, scrapped, scrapped in a, with, within one month, it is not acceptable at all that, that we are continuing to support the European Parliament today. Democratic countries in the world, uh, they have been delisted from the terrorist organization and as your wife is again a lawyer, I don't think that it's not, it's not really fair to uh, call the group uh, a terrorist until they have not been approved by a fair more than one hour of documentary about the, what these people are doing there and it's strange that you didn't see that. And the last one is from Mr. Pede that you mentioned, which uh, several peoples. But uh, 